any role for repeat testing? So in breast cancer, the standard of care is to do a new biopsy for HER2. How about in colon? You know, it, it probably at some point would make sense. Right now, I don't think that I would advocate for one. HER2 uh, is still technically experimental. But even for RAS? Uh, for the and, RAS, and, yeah. yeah. For the RAS and the BRAF, it's unlikely to change mind much through the life uh, history, at least genotypically. Phenotypically, you may, but you're not going to capture that with a repeat test. I think ultimately, you know, we're going to move away from tissue-based testing to liquid-based testing that will essentially give you a snapshot of the changing uh, genetic profile of the of the sum of the tumors across time. And that probably would be more beneficial than just, uh, you know, a glimpse of one biopsy of a single site at a, at, a, at a given time. A lot of people talk in liquid biopsies. Anybody using them as their primary way of testing? Well, Not right no. now. No, no. But no. the first no. one was just approved yeah. right. in lung cancer for EGFR mm -hmm. mutations. Right. So that's, the foot is in the door. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Um, but, but in the intergroup study that Peter O'Dwyer is running, the so-called bucket or basket, we'll be talking about taper and match. Yeah. Same sort of uh, study. Uh, it, we're actually mandating, Stan Hamilton, who's the consultative on that, we're mandating repeat biopsies in people who are more than 12 months out from their original archived primary tumor. I tell you, I, I, as you all know, I'm involved in this big sort of national molecular profiling effort. And, and the reason I really ask about this is that we're sending lot serial samples. So the primary mm -hmm. gets sent, then a met gets sent, then mm -hmm. something else gets, and we're seeing it change over time, oh, yeah. clearly. And this this past week, we found a patient whose primary tumor was all four proteins were present, right? So they were all there. Has a MET, we resect it, we happen to profile it, MSI high. And so we're actually cross-checking to make sure the labs are correct. So, so one that we were sure, and so I used my adjuvant therapy based on M, you know, right. MSS, and now with metastatic disease, we're in an MSI setting. So I just wonder if we're only starting to understand the, the fluidity of the molecular profile yeah, of our I, cancers. I, I, I think that that goes back to the to the point of the liquid versus the tissue based. The problem with the tissue based is you're not really capturing the same, you know, population of cell every single time you're taking a biopsy. And we know that the concordance rate is about 80%. So there's actually 20%, which is uh, between metastatic and primary. 20% yeah. is 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 a decently large a number, so it's likely, so, so you could interpret this as differences between sites rather than a changing genome. That's one of the challenges with tissue-based biopsy. Yeah, Tara, do you think it's at a point then where we should actually recommend to our audience that, well, I'm not sure, I'm going to send it again or do another tissue or not quite there yet? Is this all just talk at the academic level? I really think it depends on the patient themselves. If they have been stable for a long time and all of a sudden the primary is stable and something new grows, mm. I biopsy that. And see if there's if it's safe to biopsy. That's yeah. the caveat. No, I think but. that's really good advice. Anybody else thoughts that sound good? No, I fully agree with that. I think it's very reasonable. I mean, if something is out of the ordinary, you need to resample it and reevaluate it. Yeah. What's the biggest pain in the neck that we can share with our audience about getting tissue done? Cost. Paid for. Paid yes. for. <laughs> Insurance approval. Coverage. Uh, to me, it's access, too. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, you, you, sometimes the only biopsy we've got is a colonoscopic biopsy that's a, you know, little alligator clip size snip, yep. and it's gone, you yep. know, in the initial. So you've yeah. got to find it and, it, and it takes time to figure that out, right? You send exactly. off a block and right. they don't have sometimes enough. Sometimes you have to prioritize. And they ask for more, then they and ask then you have to do it again. All right. So um, how do we really advise our audience, Tony? G give me your uh, high level. What do you tell a general oncologist who sees regular colon cancer patients, molecular testing, how do they handle it? No, I think you have, you have to really go where, where you, the, the money is right now and make sure that you have enough in terms of prioritization to get the whole RAS testing. Uh, I think it's important to have BRAF for multiple considerations. Some of them are actually therapeutic. Uh, MSI, very important, again, uh, both as a ther therapeutic uh, component, but also, you know, it may link back to uh, a family history that would be important uh, to figure out. I mean, you know, with, with, less nuclear, with you know, less nuclear families, smaller families, it's very difficult to get a good family history sometimes by itself. And then HER2, 
uh, would be on the lower list of priorities. I think it's important, but I wouldn't uh, sweat too much over it right now. But I think RAS, MSI, BRAF would be important to start with to go down down that decision tree. But I think it's important though to think about her two new testing because we taught people about BRAF testing because mm. no one used to test for it before. Mm. And now people are testing for it. Now we have trials for it. We know it's a poor prognostic indicator. So the reason I bring that up is just because we know we're going to have a trial with, with Herceptin as, as an option for patients. It's less than 10% of patients that are going to be HER2 new positive, but still, I think we need to educate people. The biggest pushback I get on this, and I completely agree with what you're all saying, is or doing an even broader profile and getting a ROS mutation or some other, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, mutation Alcrim for some right. ALK or something yeah. uh, in a colon cancer is that, okay, great, now how do I get drug? I mean, I've got a patient okay. in the hospital right now who we got her profile back and she's HER2 positive. And of course, you know, they could afford a month's worth of this therapy, but not much more than that. Mm -hmm. So we need a mechanism to get access to these drugs and study whether or not there's a positive outcome. Is there such a thing, Dr. Haller? Well, there, there are a number of large studies we'll be talking about, the MATCH trial, the big intergroup trial, et cetera, the bucket trials, basket trials, um, to, to try to get information about this so that you have the backup for being able to do that, of saying that you have found an action, a mutation, then you found an, actual, uh, an actionable mutation, then you need an available drug. Getting all three things together is difficult. The only one we really have any evidence for is our drugs we've had for 12 years now, since 2024. Um, for cetuximab, the EGFR inhibitor, penitumab. So I think that's the, the basic. That's the one people absolutely have to do. Yeah. The others are a little bit in the future. 